Well, uh, welcome everybody. I think we are like in a family with the members of that they have been taking care uh, part in the workshop. So I'm not. Steinun doesn't need to be introduced to you. You you know her by now perfectly. Uh, what I would like to put in context is her presence here in a school of architecture. No, somebody that comes from fashion design or cutter or as you want to call yourself but why why a school of architecture in Spain is looking for characters like her no? abroad to bring her here and everything started uh, three years ago when we had the opportunity to invite uh, Prada Pool who is a, an architect from Madrid that he offered himself to come here to Alicante to organize a workshop based on pneumatic architecture. Pneumatic architecture basically for Prada Pool was to take plastic that we got it free, hundreds of square meters from a greenhouse and with just a stabler he taught the students how to put the plastic together and with a small fan from home inflated and it was bigger than this room. Then it was a moment of emotion for every student from all of us how we could do something with our hands and suddenly create a scale one-to-one, -one, no? an instant architecture that we decided that, that we should continue searching for people working in, in that way, no? the, that instant uh, architecture scale one-to-one. -one. The following year, we invited from Ottawa in Canada, Manuel Baez, who is an architect that a professor at Carleton University, and he works with, with uh, uh, sticks, sticks, uh, kebab sticks, something like that, 30 centimeters long. Again, we, we bought many, many kebab sticks, and the guy in the shop said, wow, guy, what a party you are going to, a barbecue you are going to organize. When I said many is more than a cubic meter of kebab stick, and with rubber, we make an incredible structure as well, the students, they, they, they created, that, that structure now is indeed in the Museum Emilio Pérez Piñero in Calasparra. The following year, we brought from Arkansas University in the States, uh, Santiago Pérez is another architect. You can see that there are Latin names here. It's to say, how can I convince somebody from the States to come here? They were like second, th third generation of Spanish or somebody who had been there in the States and their dream was to come back to see the motherland. Then in a way, we convinced them like in that way. No? But they came here, uh, Santiago, and he was working with... Uh, cloth, very cotton cloth, in tension, and then he painted with resins. What he was doing is like a shell, like an egg shell. Had, when it got dry, it had a lot of strength. No? And again, he made the last structure was a piece that we put under it a grand piano, and he started, his dream was to play the piano. He started playing the piano the last day, and over that shell, so thin as I say, not even a millimeter, then we put salt. So when the piano was playing, the vibration of the structure of the shell was putting to vibrate all the salt, and the salt started moving, creating patterns. They were like roses, flowers. It was, it, that, that workshop, it was called uh, architecture to visualize the sound. Imagine, you know, those three, no, this series, how can you look, find somebody that match that high level, no? And it was the trip to, with the master students, we went to Iceland, we went to see Steinun, she showed us her work and her philosophy, and wow, it was a dream, no, to be able, when she was saying that he, she liked researching with wool no, in, in, in her case and how she was capable of teaching people to needle with their own fingers no, we were wondering is, we, 
could you imagine the students of architecture doing like this, no? mm -hmm. building spaces no? like those? We saw here and indeed we had sent images of silk worms, the cocoons, no? and she, she was as well hooked. Then is to, to thank you, to thank you so much, Estino, to, to come here to, to spend. I know that it's a lot of effort. But you have your life, your business, your design, and then it's not nothing. It's not easy at all for a person like her to say, "Okay, I disappear from home and everywhere for two and a half days." More than that, because to come here is another day, and to go there is, is almost a week, no? And well, it's something is precious. I mean, I think that all of you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's a memory that you will have with you forever. Then. That emotion is one of the aspects extremely important for us. The second one is the technique. All of you have learned a technique. How technique is, how important it is in architecture, whatever you deal with. And the third one is, has been very good for us to be able, for a school of architecture where everything is structured in separate subjects, models, how a workshop like that helps professors to speak each other, to, to, to establish different coordination, then it's very healthy for the school itself. So thank you again, thank you for, for your experience no? to, 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 to share with us these fantastic days. Um, I have to say something, guys. I learned a lot too. It goes both ways. So this for me was an eye-opener in many ways. So whatever you took with you, I take home with me a lot. And that's always the beautiful thing about workshops. It really is about that. How you deal, just like the loop. There is an in and it goes out again. So I learned a lot from you guys. So take that with you. Well, I leave you. And again, I want to thank the Politecnica, the Escuela Politecnica, for this supporting our workshops. Um, I'll leave you with her. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, this lecture um, is actually about the story of my loop. How I learned the looping technique, which is knitting, and what I actually did with it, and what I made out of it. It's also a story about aesthetic. You will have to learn a lot about aesthetics. And through almost three decades of, actually two decades working in high fashion and uh, one decade of working for myself, I'm still searching. And I will never stop. My aesthetic is always, I'm always searching for something new even though I maintain something I can call mine. But it took me a while to, to learn it. So while we go through this, some of the images you've seen, we started out, I took a few pieces out of there in the beginning, so you've seen it. There are very few words that describe who I am. I learned knitting from my, gra oh, here we go again. Uh, why is it doing that? I have no idea. I learned from my grandmother. Um, I found that knitting is a form of meditation. I had extreme passion with numbers. And I really, uh, um, um, sorry guys, it's the same thing again. I was very naive when I went through to New York. Um, I was the first Icelandic student to go to Parsons School of Design. And I ended up working in high fashion. Simplicity, really, that's what it took. Hours of work, months of work, yes. But I learned, happened to be extremely fortunate to learn from the masters in high fashion. I showed you in the beginning what a knitting thought actually is. Everybody thinks of, yeah, the grandmother, right? We saw this yesterday. She's knitting. 
It's amazing today. I'm sure you've changed your mind. Two days later, you're not, not thinking about a grandmother, are you? No. You built structure out of it. You did something with it. There's no grandmother in our, uh, uh, in our presence anymore. Now we look at the youth. You are the youth. Banksy, I will forever be thankful for him for doing this image. Um, we also talked about in the beginning the fabrications that are made out of knitting. Today, you all wear it. A lot of you are wearing it right now. Knitted cloth. You actually knit it with a circular knitted fabric, which is beautiful. Um, I worked in high fashion for some of the big names you already know. I started out for a very small company, uh, Carmelo Pomodoro. From there on, I went to work for Ralph Lauren. Um, and trust me, my Icelandic, my English Icelandic was so harsh at the time that he made fun of how I pronounced the word Kashmir. I couldn't say it. Uh, from uh, Ralph, I went on to working for Calvin for six years. There is an incredible um, interview uh, for the Design March in Iceland. Um, he came to Iceland three years ago. And you can see the interview I had with him for 45 minutes. It's on Vimeo, uh, on the Design March. Um, it's a fantastic interview. If you want to hear from the master what he how he did it. Um, he actually made me the soldier that I became within the fashion. I learned the ropes from a truly a human being that knew everything about fashion. What he also taught me, which was the essence of it, that he let me play. I was allowed to play. He did not hold me back. If I wanted to knit something, test out a yarn, do whatever, he let me do it. And for that, I am him forever grateful because I went out on a journey with the technicians and the factories, and I created the biggest cashmere line that was going on in the United States at the time. It was fantastic years. But guys, I smoked a lot at the time and drank a lot of coffee, I'll tell you that much. And I traveled very extensively to all the factories. From there on, I went to work for Gucci, and uh, um, I'll get back to that story a little later. Uh, worked for La Padilla as the design director, uh, starting their col uh, women's collection line uh, after, um, the, after the actual the, um, the underwear line. So I learned a lot about uh, underwear and corslets. And then I started my own collection. When working for Calvin, uh, this is one of the first hand-knitted pieces I did. I was truly, I have no idea why it does this, but you forgive me. Um, when, um, when you do a hand-knit, um, uh, it takes a lot of time. But I also wanted to do some of the in intricate cables and I hand knit, had them all hand knitted into extensive wool from Peru. Cashmere, I became the expert on cashmere. I was knitting yarns, tape yarns. There was not, um, 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 this was the first time it ever um, appeared in uh, fashion. I was working with extreme beautiful uh, patterns that I didn't know existed. This one I found in Japan. Um, and then let's get back to Gucci. I'm trying to stop this uh, automatic... Um... Can you come up here and do it for me? Oh, I know. Uh, and neither do I. Hi uh, click it and do... Pausa. Pausa. Oh, there you go. Oh, perfect. Um, as you can see, 
that even with all the knitted cloth I tried to create, there was a texture. Can you see it? I was always looking for the texture. When it came to Gucci, I kept on working uh, because it really, really uh, uh, made me want to explore more about what the possibilities were. Nobody believes that this is actually knitted. It is knitted. This is actually shot in Iceland. You can see it in the sky. Beautiful linen pieces or very, very fine silk that, yes, got onto the covers, got into the best magazines. It was extraordinary times to work for a high fashion company. This was also the time when Gucci was really exploding. The pattern you just saw, let me go back. I printed this on a knitted fabric because I really had to try the technique. So everything I actually did was testing the techniques. Whatever I could find, it was dip dyeing, whatever I could find was the technique or the old craft or what I could deal with. By doing that, I became a master of the knitted cloth. Because like you saw, and you, you did this, the knitted cloth is just, a, the, you start with a string. You are, when you are a knitwear designer, you are the creator of the cloth. Most designers buy their fabric already made for them. You don't buy the concrete made for you. It comes in a liquid form. This is very, you can create whatever you want with this. So that's the part that I love the most, is to be the creator of the fabric. I make it. Everything you have showed to so far as images goes from high fashion are actually made with a loop. The same technique you guys just did. It's a loop. It's a knitting. It's a form of knitting. Um, this is actually crocheted. It's one of the few crocheted pieces I did uh, out of a very special yarn, uh, Gucci. Here we go into La Perla. And... Um, I was in love with the construction of the, uh, of actually the, the underwear. But let me remind you that uh, most of the underwear uh, for Gucci was actually, um, I had my head, a lot of fingers in there because I really enjoyed uh, finding the techniques I could do, uh, the construction of the bras or the construction of the underwear to do seamless seams or, or how you could actually find a knitted cloth that would actually work very beautiful for a second skin. Because that's exactly what underwear is today. It's second skin. <coughs> More La Perla, beautiful sensual uh, uh, silk pieces and, um, and uh, chill pieces. But where does all of this come from? Who am I? I believe that surroundings come from growing up in an environment. You come from all over. I come from this. I've seen a lot of lava and I'm completely, I've seen a lot of rocks and I'm completely inspired by it. And I've used it to enhance all the textures I work in. Beautifully open knit weaving more lava that actually works into um, solstice lace, ensuring it. I carved the lava field out in the fur, fur jacket. Fish skin, actual fish skin jacket. Aerial view of a frozen water knitted. Fresh River, meeting um, uh, Glacier River. I combined two forms of yarn to create mine. Dirty snow. 
frost-bitten snow, beautiful lace embroidered with mohair, snow dunes instead of sand dunes, strips of fur four millimeters in thick, ice on lake embroidered with mohair on shiny velvet, ice on the ocean knitted, New fallen snow. It's beautiful how new fallen snow is like a feather. Water. How can you create a feeling of water in fabric? Colors. Landmannerlöhr. Somebody in here has actually traveled to Landmannerlöhr. Hot springs. My hot springs were suede, applique on chill with little beads or the patterns that are actually printed on silk, or rivers that went down from a hip down to the floor, or mountain ridges from Landmannerlöhr that I pleated and printed onto the fabric. Staying in the company, now I'm gonna actually do this again, sorry guys, yep, all right, see if it works. Uh, Stainum was actually started in the year 2000. I started from very small. Um, I actually, I think I did six pieces of clothing. And trust me, guys, I did a mistake. I made the most beautiful pieces in the world in the most expensive factories I could find. It was so expensive that nobody bought it. Yes. Everybody makes mistakes, and you guys will make a mistake. You just have to admit that it's possible that you do. Uh, it took me a year to get back on my feet again because I was devastated. I thought I was the best designer on this earth. I was so wrong. It's a long journey, really a long journey. Um, I'm not showing you uh, the beginning photographs because you have to realize I was living in a country where there was no fashion industry. There were no fashion photographers. There were hardly any stores that were selling Icelandic design. And in the year 2000, the Icelandic Academy of Art opened and it was the first time ever in the history of Iceland we could actually learn fashion design. I studied mine abroad. So I was moving into a country where, yes, there was no industry, period. And everybody said to me, you are crazy. What in the hell are you doing up there? Excuse my language. Well, I believe that in order to find who you really are, get, a, get as far away from it as possible and find out who you really are and I went back home. There is no high fashion there. Whatever you will be seeing in these photographs comes from whatever I have experienced there and me searching through archives of photographs of whatever I can find. And that in itself has actually made me the designer that I am today. I started all of the things you see in here, except for the few pieces I will be mentioning, is knitted. So you can see that my knowledge of knitting and how to work with the factories and the technicians um, is extensive. And it's also my constant search for the material to work with. The material to work with is essential for you guys. You may like plastic, other one may like concrete, and one may like steel, and one may like glass. It's essential for you guys to find really, really the material you like to work with. Again, you see, I constantly use nature to work with in all my work. This was the first time there was actually a fashion photographer that came home, and I was fortunate enough to actually use him. It was fantastic that I could actually do that. Um, 
I'm showing you a bunch of collections that I've done because they show a certain story. This one, for instance, for some odd reason, I hated it. I didn't show these pictures for almost six years. How stupid is that? That's my own vanity. I admit, I deal with vanity like everybody else. Nobody's perfect. They're beautiful. Now that I look back, it was just me being silly. The portrait collection was actually something that um, changed the way I think. I met a fashion dis um, a photographer named Mary Ellen Mark. Mary Ellen Mark is a very famous American photographer. Um, she has done a tremendous amount of work um, 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 behind the scenes in film, and she did a lot of work for Life magazine. Her work is extremely well known in the States. And I met her through, uh, um, in Iceland, actually through my son. My son is disabled and she was photographing disabled children. Uh, through that extreme strange connections, we bonded. And um, she offered me to come to New York and photograph my collection on a large Polaroid camera. It needed three people to operate the camera itself. There's no Photoshop in here. The paper comes out after you do the one click. The film is extremely expensive. And that's when my, the word craft came in. Every, every field has a craft. The paper came out, you put it up on the wall, and you waited 90 seconds for it to dry before you could take the paper off. It is the most beautiful um, photographs I've seen because they're crystal clear. There is, you can see anything on there. How I started with it, I started by going into the archives of the National Museum and finding portraits of women in national costume. I used it as my base for my collection and by using some of the beautiful craft that was in the national costume, I therefore said yes to do the photographs the way I did. And let me show you guys. I'm going to go through this very slowly. The bow from the national costume, my bow became like this. The volume of the hats from the national costume was the same volume as my hats. And you can see how beautiful and crystal clear the photographs are. Uh, Mary Ellen um, um, actually did a, a, an exhibition at the National Museum called Extraordinary Children, uh, photographs of disabled children. And she also did a documentary on my son. You can actually see that a documentary on her website. It was, uh, it was an eye-opening thing to actually meet her because she opened my eyes, just the way you guys opened my eyes also. Um, this collection um, revolutionized the way I see things and how I see fashion. It completely changed the way I saw fashion. These were, polar, these were portraits. These are not fashion photography. Um, every, every photograph you see is, took an hour, if not two, just to set it up to make sure there was not a hair in place, nothing. They come as is. There's nothing on there that has been changed. Um, we did few collections together. Our friendship was very deep, uh, and she um, passed away last year, unfortunately. Um, but she taught me a lot about New York, about how to relate patterns to the environment. We thought this collection would fit perfectly with graffiti in New York City. And I remind you that all the pieces come from somewhere. 
All the inspiration and the textures come from Iceland somewhere. My favorite shot. Then we did the second large Polaroid black and white shoot. And again, um, it was quite extraordinary because this time around, we didn't use the portrait woman. We used the lava, the, the, the bold lava as inspiration. So it was about a large texture. For that, I received the largest uh, design award in uh, Scandinavia for this part, which was uh, very nice. And what was also very nice was the fact that I was the first fashion designer to actually receive that. So I broke into a new field with fashion that had not been done in Scandinavia before. Um, so the, the, the eyes on fashion in Scandinavia kind of shifted, which was very interesting because fashion was now a part of the whole design field, which it hadn't been in the past. As you can see, I used the, the hot spring um, colors and formation to put into the skirt. Um, you can see how beautiful the photographs are. This happens to be one of my favorites. Favorite, favorite, favorite photograph. Um, and this needs no explanation. You know exactly where this comes from. Um, Mary Ellen had this thing to say about fashion. She didn't find it real. Of course, we disagreed upon that. Um, but she kind of made me look at it in a new way, that fashion is not about what appears in the fashion magazines. And there I agreed with her. Fashion is timeless. Just the way buildings are timeless. It, a 10-year-old building still exists on the street and is a part of the environment. Then you've done your job. The same way you can wear a piece of clothing in 10 years and it's not a part of a fashion line that appears, disappears in three months. That I agree. Even Chanel talked about that. So there's a lot of similarities between architecture and fashion, but in a very different way. Meaning, it takes you guys three years to build a collection. When you work in high fashion, it takes three months. But the process in the same is the same. I have to do a spec sheet. You guys have to do a spec sheet. You need a building constructor. I need a production manager. I work with the thread. You work with liquid concrete. So there is the same way. It really is. A similarities. The feather collection was fun because we did large Polaroids in color. I've never seen color photographs so amazingly good. And as you can see, I was still using the landscape of Iceland to work into the texture. This refers to Marion uh, series called The Twins, which is very famous in America. Um, I thought it was time in Iceland to actually um, show some diversity in that country. Um, and I'm very glad I did. You can see with the lava down the dresses. Texture and more texture. See the colors of the red in these polaroids. They were absolutely beautiful. Again, fabric with, with lyrics in it. I always go the same route. I, I want the textiles that I work with to say something to me. It's not just a flat fabric. The shadows.
The Aurora, Colle Aurora Colle Collection was actually a little, um, about a year after the financial crash, and everybody was talking about resources. We, the, the resources of the nation were going to save us. But aluminum is not going to save us. The creativity is going to save us. The darkness, the snow, the endless snow that we have, the inspiration from those things is definitely going to save us more than an aluminum factory. That was my answer to that. And the Aurora Borealis. The Aurora Borealis you can actually see from Reykjavik. I can actually see it from my window in the winter time. So it's very crystal clear to me that the resources we use are right there in front of our eyes. The knot collection, I went back to the national costume because there are a lot of knots that hold up that little apron, the white apron that goes down that, see that white apron? Oops, ooh, ooh. The white apron that goes down right there. Let me put this on pause. See that white apron that goes down uh, her skirt? This cloth, and it's very important for me to actually know this. This cloth, uh, women in Iceland made their national costume. And um, uh, during those times in the 1800s, uh, they weren't allowed to say very much. But through embroidery and handcraft, they showed what they needed to say. It was their way of communicating. But there were no zippers and there were no buttons at the time. So they found a technique in order to hold up that little piece of cloth. There was actually the cloth they needed to put their hands behind when they went to church because their hands were so severely damaged from work that they were hiding their beautiful working hats because the clothing needed to be present, not their working hats. The way this piece of cloth is held up is with strings, knotted strings in different places, and they, then they tucked the knotted strings underneath the belt, and that's how they stayed up. What a fantastic technique. I've been telling you guys that I always go to museums to find um, new techniques in old, you know, uh, national costumes. They are very important because they actually showed us what was there before what we know came. Okay. All of this is hand done. There's not a stitch of uh, a sewing machine in there. It's all hand done. And that's what I mean. People before had a craft. The craft can teach us a lot going forward. I learned about the knot and the loop and the whole thing, and I used it to make a career out of it. The knot collection was full of knots, as you can see. That's actually a woven piece, as you can see right there. It's all knitted, knitted knots. You guys did a lot of knots. Shuring in, in satin silk reminds you of, of lava. Uh, it's very important for me to, when I travel, that I get to see the National Museum of each country. Because then I learn about the culture. I don't care where the culture comes from. There's so much craft involved. Oh, yes, hold on, guys. <gasps> Oh my God. Do you know I'm on a stamp in Iceland? If you get a letter from me, you get my stamp. Do you know how cool it is to go to the post office and say, can I have an arch, a small arch of stain and stamps, please? Oh, it's the coolest thing ever, ever. I just went to the post office two weeks ago and bought four. First fashion designer to be on a stem. It's about breaking and opening new doors for me. And I really, really like that idea that my small little country, now I understand the reason why I went home because 
there, I needed to give back to society. That's one of the reasons I went back home. I wanted people to learn from me. And trust me, I've taught a lot of people in Iceland. The Admiral Collection, I, uh, my father is an Admiral of the National Coast Guard, so um, of course I dedicated it to him. Voila, the Admiral. It was the first time I ever did a menswear collection. I still do menswear. I'm building it up slowly, menswear sweaters. Um, I haven't photographed it the same way I do the women's wear, but it will take me about five years to actually do a really large collection from menswear, and I'm working on it. Um, it's getting bigger, the collection, and the sweaters are selling better, so everything takes slow time to build up. That is for you. <laughs> um, this is a wonderful collection shot by a photographer from Sweden, from actually from Gothenburg. It was shot in the countryside. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, explore what hap would happen if I would take, get out, out of the studio, the, the, the photographic studio, and see what, what would happen. I actually made a video also, uh, but yeah, I ended back in the studio. But you have to try. Whether the photographs are good or not, they're a part of my search. And that is what I'm showing you. The search is the most important thing. You have to try something. So my workshop with you guys was totally about that experiment. You have to try it. If you don't, you're not going to go anywhere. I'm still searching. I still think that I'm not, you know, I have not done anything but my husband needs to tell me that I've done a lot. Because I'm always searching. I really, really, genuinely want to learn more. Um, what was interesting about this collection was that um, I wasn't really sure how to put it together. And maybe that's what, um, why I'm not so sure about the photographs. But at the same time, I think they're really, really beautiful. Um, I was fortunate enough to be chosen the uh, Reykjavik City Artist, and out of that came uh, a solo exhibit at the Reykjavik Art Museum. Um, I've done extensive work with museums, uh, meaning either curated exhibit um, um, or put up exhibit f uh, about my own work. And I think that was my own path into more search, was, was guiding my own uh, interest into the, uh, towards the arts, because I felt that there was more ways of, ex you know, things that I could try there. Um, the Black Snow Collection uh, was very interesting for me because uh, it really um, was about a lot of texture, different texture. Natural light, trying new things, cable sweaters, testing new ways of doing cable sweaters, hats and formations, new sculpting things, new uh, proportions, and I really enjoyed it. I felt I was back on track again because we all have down periods in our, you know, creative life. That's a fact. Uh, the Black Snow also collection, I changed my color scheme. As you can see, it was the first time I ever did light colors. I photographed them. I've usually never done that before. So it was very interesting for me. Uh, I also used a dancer, not a model. That was fantastic for me also to go through that. and interesting hats, of course. And like I said, um, oh sorry, um, 
This was my third uh, exhibit that I curated at the National Museum of Iceland. And I was actually fortunate enough to curate their 150 anniversary exhibit about the silver and gold that the National Museum owns. And uh, I was uh, locked up in their archives with thousands and thousands of pieces of jewelry. It was like finding a cave of jewelry, guys. <laughs> I was treasure hunting. It, it, it literally felt like that. Um, um, the tables were so long and they were full of jewelry. It was incredible feeling. It was freezing in there, so I had to wear gloves and hats and scarf and you name it. But what an incredible feeling to actually look at it and say, wow, how lucky am I to be able to put this up? This, um, we made a huge art installation with the pieces, which was uh, very interesting for me to actually uh, make art out of jewelry. And I made dragons out of belts and you name it, and uh, it became a cave. It became a cave that children could go in with their headlights and they would find little anima, animals made out of bracelet and stuff. Uh, they ended up having the exhibit up for two years. And a lot of children learned because we divided the ex exhibit up in craft, different craft of jewelry. And it was a fantastic way of expanding my own knowledge of our heritage and the craft of jewelry. The Weather Diaries. The Weather Diaries is um, a part of the Nordic Fashion Biennale, which I happen to be the godmother of. Uh, it all started during the financial crash. Uh, the curators that I chose for this uh, biennale are actually from Gothenburg. Uh, Sarah and Nina Cooper. Their photographs uh, reminded me a lot of the Mary Ellen photographs. And they're not fashion photography. This was the best Nordic Fashion Biennale we've done. And let me tell you that the Nordic Fashion Biennale is uh, a project between three Nordic islands. Iceland, Faroe Islands, and of course Greenland, even though Greenland is a little big isle of an island. Yes, they are part of the Nordic islands that we belong to. Uh, fashion designers were chosen from these uh, um, three islands and we all exhibited, we photographed, we went through a uh, long process of dealing with weather and what the weather meant for us and how it all um, made us who we are. And it's different between Faroe Islands, Iceland and Greenland. But it isn't at the end of the day. That's what we all agreed upon when, uh, after we'd been together after the first opening. It's traveled all over from the Design Museum in Frankfurt to the Royal Library in Copenhagen. Uh, we're putting it up for the seventh time in Minneapolis, in a large museum in Minneapolis, which is uh, quite something for fashion designers from the Nordic countries. Uh, as you can see, it's about, yeah, it's about a thought process. It's not fashion, but it's all related to fashion. This piece, even though she is wearing this piece in the photograph, it is actually not a piece that's sewn together. It's a piece, and this is, uh, for me, it was very interesting to see you guys today. What you see here is a, uh, um, a large installation um, that, I, uh, that follows this exhibit. It's actually huge. And it has the image with the headpiece and the dress and the whole thing and the entire texture but nothing is sewn together. 
It's all suspended from a large plate in the ceiling. It takes me a week to put it all together. I use about 10 kilometers of string in it and I need about five people to help me for a week because it's hollow on the inside. There is nothing there and everything comes apart. So I can never recreate the dress itself perfectly because I don't know where all these little pom-poms go and there are thousands of them. It's like she's rising from the floor. And this you guys saw, this is my rhythm knitting projects. I've told you about it. Uh, we've used drummers, done installations, knitted with lights, suspended it from ceilings in, inside um, some really great studios. This you know, you've done it. It's very different from you did, from what you guys did outside, because it was in dark. We used two drummers last time in the Nordic house in Iceland. Fantastic session. More lights, Aberdeen, Scotland, different drummers, very colorful drums. Outside installation with lights. And then we start the lava collection. Um, the lava collection is actually my, um, my anniversary collection. I took a lot of things from my archive. I own a, uh, every single piece that I've ever designed for the last 15 years for my company. I have a piece of. So I can actually go into my archive and really use whatever I need to use from there. I know it sounds strange, but it's actually a part of who you are. And it's a part of your own aesthetics that you're trying to go through. Don't throw things away. Dieter Roth said that. He used every single thing he had and he made art out of it. What you're working with is really things you need to work with in order to go forward. Don't throw, don't dismiss it. It may be horrible today, but it might be beautiful in five years. My anniversary collection is about, again, about texture, hats, You can see, I love the, the working, I, I used the fabric to turn it into something. It's a beautiful uh, skirt with crazy, crazy pattern. I use colors, non-colors. Again, my dancer is there. So I am, I am consistent in my own research. I haven't edited it yet, guys, and this is the first time I'm actually showing it to the public. I don't photograph when I'm supposed to. I photograph afterwards because I really need to know the clothing before I photograph them. I have no idea which ones I'm going to actually use or going to go on my website. Uh, I'll edit them. but. I like to throw them out in the, in, into the air, into the abyss. 
Because by doing that, you're kind of seeing um, um, yourself, what works and what doesn't. So you have to be uh, not afraid of doing it. I'm doing it right here with you guys. I may crop them, I may change them, I may do whatever I want with them. But these are as raw as they come. They haven't been photoshopped yet. There is nothing there. I may not photoshop them. I also like the fact that Mary Ellen's portraits, I'm seeing them again. Can you see it? I'm consistent. I'm consistent with the hats. I'm consistent with a lot of things. That I'm happy about. Lighting, non-lighting. So fashion for me is about creating something. Just the way you guys think you, uh, 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 you're you here to finish school and that you're going to go out and work. It doesn't happen overnight. Let me tell you that much. It really does not happen overnight. My suggestion to all of you is that you actually go and work somewhere. Find out what your aesthetic is in the meantime. Nobody has it all when they come out of school. Trust me. You can see, I've done a lot of testing in my lifetime. My testing is now helping me today. You may not like what I do. That's okay because it's my aesthetic and I don't expect people to like my aesthetic. But what you have to admit and admire is my process. How I used a loop and a form of craft to make a career out of. And I've done it my way. I created the big departments at the big companies I worked for. I became the large cashmere producer. I quadrupled, I don't know how much I increased the, the sales at uh, knitwear uh, at Gucci. And that nobody can take away from me. I am the creator of that. That is so important that when you guys go out there that you realize that you have to make it. Nobody else does it for you. You are the only people that can make it work. There's nobody going to hand it to you on a silver, silver plate and say, here, you are the greatest architect there ever is going to be. I work across parallel design fields because I think it's important. I am working on a large project with uh, an artist on making music with knitting. I'm working on a project with uh, weaving knitting uh, together in a, in a, in a, in a gallery. Uh, I'm constantly searching. I'm working with, uh, um, yeah, I did a film with a filmmaker because I wanted to experiment what it was to make a costume. Yes, I'm extremely fortunate. I was actually nominated for the costume part. I didn't realize that that was going to happen. I just wanted to try a new thing. I'm constantly finding ways to expand myself into other creative fields. This is my first time ever to speak to architects. And you guys didn't know when I was making you, some of you guys knit something, what you guys were knitting. The circular piece that you also, nobody knew what was going on, except me. I thought it was brilliant. But what you guys have not seen and not done, and this is my critic on your work today, is that when we were making the cocoons, they were invisible. The inside of them was invisible. Just the way my installation is invisible. I can take it all apart. 
The cocoons could have been much more of a cocoon. That's your in invisible space in your head, and that's so beautiful. You create it in your head, and you surround it with something that's almost that invisible also. For me, you needed to create something in your mind and then dress it around. I hope for your next workshop that you think about it and figure out whatever form you're doing and then you dress that around. That's how fashion designers work. And it's a fantastic way of working. All I'm saying is, I know your teachers teach you a certain way. Try a different approach. Try a graphic designer's approach. Try a fashion designer approach. Because it may give you something new. That's what I'm saying to you guys. I learned a lot. I am so inspired that I can make a knitted things out of corded steel or something. Yeah, I can make a screen. I'm just going, my mind is exploding. That's what you guys taught me. So working with a different field has been fantastic for my own, own research. And she's going to say good thank you on that note, guys. Um, I also want to have a little conversation about what you can do with this, where you can take this, what is the new thing. It may not be a knitted a yarn piece or whatever. You can do it in so many ways. We spoke about that today. But what else can you do with it? What else can you do with it? Can you take it into a playground? Can you, what else can you do? You can take it into furniture, you can take it into, what else? Not a word? Come on guys, you, you were speaking a lot today. <laughs> Thank you. Pink concrete, exactly. Fantastic. That is what I'm hoping that you go or walk away from more. We, we taught a very young girl to knit and she's not stopping. More, guys? Technology? Technology, so yes. Programs like Rhino and Grasshopper to create the shape. So the shapes you did with the cloth you cut by adapting the technology and the technique, you can change the shape of concrete. So the yes, you can. Yeah. It also taught you that you guys can do make things full scale and tr and test it, and that maybe you could use and look and pattern making to see how the yield is completely worked out because that is also what you have to do when it comes to you buy a certain meters of, of wood. How are you going to make sure you fill, you use every single bit of it? Same thing with fabric. How are you going to use the yield up? Not have any leftovers. What are you going to do with the bits that you cut off? All of these are questions that you have to work when you get into production and into the business. It's part of the business. Those guys know, they build a house. You don't want to buy, you know, 25 meters extras of wood. You know, what are you going to do with it? It's just specialized color that you ordered. Well, you have to know your yield. We call it yield in my business. I deal with the same problems as everybody else. Any questions, guys? I would like to ask a question. So, I would, I would, if possible, I would like you to tell me what 
tell us more about the way you not only choose the textures or the yeah. design of the fabric, but the, the general shape of the dresses you are designing, the shoes, like how you uh, decide that this is going to be a skirt and this is going to be a jacket and how you choose the proportion of like not the part of the... Um, I'll tell you how. Uh, when you pick up a piece of fabric, or when I pick up a piece of fabric, um, it's either a thick fabric or like a chiffon. I know a chiffon is not going to be a coat. I also know it's going to be a soft dressing piece. When I pick up a fabric this thick, I know it's, it lends itself to tailored piece of clothing between soft dressing and tailored piece of clothing, the fabric speaks to you. I'm never going to be able to make a coat out of silk chiffon or silk satin. Silk satin is a very slippery fabric. I know that. I also know that uh, there's a lot of silk satin dresses but they're also very uncomfortable because they literally make you slip down the certain chairs. So I also know that silk satin takes color intensely. It's, there's a lot of intense, if you do a red color, the color is very intense. I also know there's a lot of shine and highlights into it. So I want to create some patterns into that satin because it gives me the highlights and the depth. So the fabric speaks to me more than anything else. So you start with the fabric and I guess you think about the comfort. But my question would be, is there anything like soci sociological or political that enters in the process with your design? Yes. Uh, it's very, for me it's very easy. Uh, um, I only use natural fibers, nothing else. Because if you wear only natural fibers, your body works with it. You can wear silk all year long, whether in hot or cold weather, because your body adapts to it. It's also for me very important that if you get into a fire, that the fabric does not burn into your skin like viscous or nylon does. So the natural fibers for me are the most common, common thing I use. I've used a viscose in my collection, but that's the only fabric of, or yarn that I've used that is not natural. Um, I would, if I were to do something else, I would use leather or something. It has to be not man-made because your body adapts to it. If you only wear wool, you can wear wool all year long. You, your body adapts to the wool. When you are thinking about the, the projection of the image of the person, I mean, there is one woman there, and it's projecting at some values, some vision on how a woman should be, or how, what's your, like the, the values of your your product, like, are you sending some image to society about a specific type of, per type of person? Is there anything like, um, uh, when we see some designs by Jean-Paul Gaultier, yeah. we see certain positions Woman. on sexuality, yeah. Yeah, yeah. on gender, yeah. is there, what, what would be your key values when you are designing, when you are thinking? Uh, um. My clothing are not about sexuality, they're actually about sensuality. Um, that's the key word for me. Um, you don't see breasts or you, you see a certain different kind. They're always covered up. They're never necklines that drop down to your stomach. Um, even though underwear is, well, underwear is, everybody thinks underwear is sexy. It's kind of essential thing for a woman to wear is underwear. Um, so I don't look at fashion as being sexy. I see, um, um, I see it as essential, and clothing is essential. 
The reason why women in Iceland only wear crewnecks, because it's always cold. It's very different from you guys, where it's really, really hot, so nobody's going to wear something that's so close to the neck in summertime. I can wear the pieces of clothing I wear today, I can wear them in the summertime. Because, yes, it can get cold. So, I'm not projecting summer clothes or winter clothes. I've been asked a lot about the hats. I actually look at it um, in a certain way and I, uh, yeah. The way I told you the story about the, 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 how the woman dressed in the old days and it was the form of speaking out loud without saying much. I use my image to say something. When uh, I chose the, the two girls to be together in a photograph and you know portray a different race in Iceland, I was saying something. People looked at it as, well, you know, bare legs and all of that, but no, it isn't about that. It's about uh, people meeting in one place in one country. Um, also, I want to project something because I'm a mother of a disabled child. He's a, minor, a mi minority group, without a doubt. Um, the hats actually come from the fact that women in the old days used to wear those strange hats, but they were saying something. They walked in there with the hats into churches, couldn't say much because the, that was not an issue. It's a woman thing for me. I'm saying something with my images that are, yeah, um, I'm a woman today. I can wear hats high and tall if I want to. And trust me, I have. And a lot of women in Iceland are picking it up. Those hats are getting more and more recognizable in Reykjavik, trust me. And it says something about you. What's come out of it also is that instead of women when they have cancer, they wrap their head in a certain way, they wear those strange hats. Why not? It's a quiet way of speaking. Uh, everybody asks me, you know, which age group you sell to. I think that's not something I portray or something. I don't want to sell by that. Um, I've seen a 13-year-old wear my clothes. I've also seen an 83-year-old wear my clothes. Age is nothing today to us. You can be 55 and be look like 35. It's, age is nothing. I think if people like my aesthetics, then we can talk then our aesthetics meet when you buy something from me. But it's not about, I'm not trying to sell to the rest of the world. I'm just trying to do, do my own thing with my own little uh, um, niche on things, how a fashion designer should be. Uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier is a fantastic designer. He also had a lot of... Uh, um, his company portrayed in Paris, he needed to follow the rules of the pret a -porter. I don't follow any rules. That's the difference between me and him. There are, trust me, there are rules within the fashion industry that we have. More questions? You said about the designs are quite natural, this way you live. How do you find it working for big companies like Gucci and Calvin Klein? fashion world is very opposite, it's not natural, it's very fake. The makeup of the ladies is a fake image, it's not representing a real. So the, the fashion industry has changed how there's more women than men, how they should look. You're, you're now referring to fashion magazines. I mean, I, I, yeah, so you were yeah. on the front of the Vogue. Yes, uh, yes. You were very natural, so how did that affect you? Um, it's a shame I didn't show you the, uh, um, the uh, incredible um, the cover of uh, uh, Spice Girls. Uh, when that cover came out, 
I actually thought that my um, that my uh, career had ended because I hated the Spice Girls. I think it's funny today. Um, fashion magazines are not what fashion designers portray. In order to see what the what the fashion designer is is putting out, you have to see his fashion show. What's being put on the fashion of Vogue or inside Vogue, we don't, or any fashion designer cannot come close to it. They are, they can lend the clothes, but it's the stylist and the people of the magazine that decide that. I have had many, many arguments about this, that everybody thinks that we live in a world that looks like a fashion magazine. It has nothing to do with us. If you would actually go and look at fashion, fashion shows from good designers, you could see that these are real clothes that most people wear. What they do in the fashion magazine is a different story. So we, we, we are not the same breed, I almost want to say that. Oh yes. Was it the same when you were working for this company? Oh yes. Um, it's my way of working. Is is through landscape. Whatever I can find, I find it beautiful. It may not work for many people, but it's my way of working. Yes. Why? Yeah, I, I can tell you why. Because I was told I couldn't get into the school. I wanted to go somewhere where people told me I couldn't go. I was told I couldn't get into the school and I got in. I was told I would never work in high fashion and I did. That's as simple as that. Uh, I also, uh, uh, I spoke English, I didn't speak very good Swedish or I didn't speak very good Danish and uh, um, I thought New York was exciting. And my father told me he would never speak to me again if I went and, you know, I did go. <laughs> yes. Like was an insulator, what you were talking about, and if, for example, you say that you invented like you find a new textile, like it feels it was really soft, like a uh, skin of a baby. But my question is, like, as you work for big fashion brands, and you also was experimenting new ways of knitting, uh, you was allowed to do it when you was working but for the big companies, or you started exploring new ways of when you decided to work for yourself? No, uh, um, uh, I tried to work in the same uh, uh, capacity as the big fashion houses. And like I said, I, my first collection was so expensive that nobody bought it. Um, um, I really tried. I had to rethink the whole concept. And also, after our fin financial crash in Iceland, I really had to rethink it all over again. Because you have to find a limit to uh, what people are willing to... You can build a house and it costs, I don't know, uh, 25 million euros, if not more. Um, how many people are going to buy that? There's a very limited market for that. The, the uh, market in Iceland for expensive clothing is not that big. But yes, I do sell expensive pieces of clothing. Um, but. Uh, that, that is who I am. Uh, if I really wanted to make clothing that uh, that uh, we can, uh, they are cheaper or something, I would have gone working for um, a H and M or somebody. Uh, I don't believe that. I think, at least for me as, as a designer, I like the 
little things in life. I like to buy the pieces that not, not everybody's wearing and everybody owns. That's who I am. So I wanted somebody to buy from me because I'm small. Yes. What makes one cloak really, really expensive? I'm sorry? What makes the cloak expensive? Well, um, we can talk about extremely expensive fur coat from an animal that, um, yeah, is, is very rare. Um, uh, it's dyed in a very special way. That's an expensive piece of clothing. We can talk about a 100% cashmere dress, hand stitched together, hand embroidered. The amount of work that goes into it is enormous. So it's not only the problem. I'm sorry? It's not only the brown and the name. No. It's the way it's made, yes. Um, things cost different things, and um, um, a coating is more, there are more seams in coating than there are in, uh, in swimwears. So it's also the seams that cost them money and the pattern making and everything. This is the first time in my life that I have to stop. No, it's okay. Please stop questioning. Never ever have done it, but you are missing your place. Oh, sorry, guys. That is the only reason. So, this year is that you need to come back because you know this stuff. Then, suddenly, you have to accept the certificates. 